Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. One of our favorite episodes is about to get a great update. Blueprints of a Rent Strike featured Bruno from the York Southwestern Tenant Union. He is back to share a victory with us. An example of people organizing to win against slumlords who dared to try to raise the rents above guidelines on a building infested with bedbugs and with a massive backlog of repairs. Residents, fed up with it all, fought back in a myriad of ways. Bruno is a great storyteller, so some of them are hilarious. All of them we can replicate. Bruno is back with us. Bruno, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself just in case people missed a blueprint of a rent strike. Hey, Jessa. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruno. I'm with the York Southwestern Tenant Union, which is a community of organized tenants in Northwest Toronto, just uh, just south of the 401 and north of uh, Lawrence. A tenant union. I just, I love hearing that. I keep going to tenant organizing when I see people just so frustrated with the lack of political effectiveness. You know, they're frustrated in all these other institutions and it's been a long time since people have seen like victories that they can share. And I feel like I can keep pointing to the growing collection of tenant unions that are all networking with one another and Bruno has come into the studio to share a path taken by some tenants, give us updates on some other rent strikes going on. But there was a victory. We I was glued to your social media feed that day, by the way, during the hearings. <laughs> you guys have done a great job of getting people really almost emotionally invested in these rent strikes. Um, I When I talk to people and I tell them there are people on rent strikes, it's like, Really? People feel really helpless in that relationship a lot of the time, right? It's kind of like we understand unions in the workplace because we understand that helplessness of going in and like begging for a raise by yourself or just having to deal with your boss's shit (laughs) and having almost nothing to do, like no recourse. So I feel like when people even know tenant unions exist, a little bit of hope kind of starts to bubble in. Like they start to understand that it's not... It doesn't have to be such an unbalanced relationship there. I'm going to give a little shout out here to Santiago. He is so emotionally invested in these stories as well, but couldn't make it today. And so I will try to represent him as best as possible, but uh, he does wish he could have been here for this discussion. But I, I'm grateful for Bruno for coming in. And uh, I mean, first, let me just give a shout out to you, Jess, and to Santiago as well for like all the work you're doing covering so many struggles like we listen to your show as audience because we are like oh, yay. we also find out perspectives that we don't often find elsewhere on so many discussions that are important to us so shout out on that and also specifically uh Santiago was there during one of the critical moments we can talk a little bit about it which was when we occupied the landlord's office for 72 hours um last December it was actually in these buildings that they just won quite a big case so um that solidarity is also felt very physically as well in terms of uh, him and through him, I guess, the whole show being there for, for us in critical moments. So it's very much appreciated. Um, yeah, so just to make the long story short, we recently had a landlord and tenant board uh, hearing. Now, unfortunately, these hearings are not in person anymore. They used to be all in person before the pandemic. Then the four government changed and said they're going to be all online to streamline the process. It actually made the process a whole more more complicated. Cases get backlogged because of the online process, uh, because it's a problem of access to justice. If you don't have a way to connect from your home, you can make the argument that you're actually not getting justice and therefore, you know, that hearing needs to be eternally postponed until you can get access to a computer or a phone with data, etc. You know, it's funny because I did read something where people were saying this is like the first time landlords and tenants both agree on something is that they have to reinstate 
at least the option for in-person hearings. Yeah, we're always very careful when talking about the landlord and tenant board because here is it's a it is a bit of like a side beef, but this is this idea that we need to strengthen the landlord and tenant board to to make the process faster, etc. Landlord and tenant board is not a friend of tenants. Most of the adjudicators who are these judges, they're not actual judges, they're adjudicators, are pro landlord. They worked in landlord paralegal firms. Um, or their landlords themselves often, uh, and especially during the DAC4 government, a lot of the new appointments are basically conservative donors that get to the LTV. And actually, landlords want to get rid of the LTV. They want a system like what exists in a lot of the US and even in Vancouver, ironically. What do they want? What could be worse, Bruno? What's worse? Well, I'll tell you. Look, if you're if in, like, it's insane that supposedly a very progressive province like BC has this. Don't get me started about that. <laughs> you know, it's a contradiction of our our political system. So they want something like in BC where um, if you're going to get evicted, the way it works is that the landlord posts a notice on your door and says, if you don't do, if you don't pay back by X day, you're evicted. And it's up to you to go to the court. So you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. It's kind of the reverse process. And in the meantime, the landlord doesn't need, there's no public office that actually deals with that. They can call uh, this private, um, they're not called sheriffs. I can't remember now the technical term. Basically, it's an office. It's a, the landlords hire these guys. They come and they say, you're evicted. If you resist, then they can call the police. But it's all a private system. And there is no, necessarily, there is no hearing or no access to justice in the process. I'm fucking horrified. I'm sorry. I'm just staring back at Bruno. with just like, <laughs> I'm watching a car wreck happen. Like... Okay, so I guess we should feel lucky we have this <laughs> horrible system <laughs> that is not oh, no. as horrible as okay. other dystopian. Okay. We were supposed to be sharing yeah. good news, bro. No, no, yeah. no, I'm joking. <laughs> Unpack it all. I mean, but then you get cases like I think the one we had where we actually, because of what we always say is we don't want to focus on the legal side of organizing. It's not our priority because we know we don't have a lot of gains to make there. But if that has to be part of the strategy because it's coming. It happens in different moments. And what you want to do is try to build up as much pressure on these courts. These adjudicators, they look at the news like you do. They, you know, they're politically uh, susceptible like anyone else. So it's not like these guys, you know, live in a basement that don't talk to anyone. And we know they talk to landlords. So whenever we have a case, we do try to make a big public case like what you see on our social media um, we cannot live stream it, which used to be done during the pandemic. And then the LTV came very hard on some tenant groups that were live streaming the hearing because... Yeah, back in May, we were able to even log on. I think you had a case with Rashid, maybe yes. even. And we all logged on. I was able to log on if you got there in time, I think. <laughs> yeah, even if you don't, you can get there late. And that's one of the, perhaps one of the side things that are good from the online system. So these are... A public court. So like any court, you can enter and witness it. And the good thing of the online court is that you can have hundreds of people join at the same time, not just the tenants, but you can have supporters join in. Obviously, they can speak, but that already, most of these hearings at the LTV are the adjudicator, the landlord's lawyer, and the tenant. The tenant often doesn't even have any kind of legal defense or rep. Yeah. What a vacuum. There's been a few institutions that have learned to use the transfer to online as a way to limit the possibilities of pushback. Yeah. Um, I think in this case, it's often not working on what they intended because now you have like, hey, I'm going to just, even if you're at work, if you're doing something else, like we have people connecting from like their factory job uh, for, or from the building. and But that adds up to, and then the other part is that you can tell Media be like, hey, if you want to tune in, this is an important hearing of something that you cover in the past, etc. Um, that's something that that we encourage as well because it just puts more more pressure on on the whole process. Were you able to tell them like, look, we are going to make Barney River look so bad today. You want to take front seat in this because I mean, people yeah. can find the Twitter thread. Maybe I'll link it in the show notes. So no, some of them are just incredible. Some oh, of the yeah, things... like just cricket from uh, one of their witnesses <laughs> trying to explain why some repair, like I think it's a giant hole in the roof or something, took a year to repair and has like 
no decent explanation because it's surprising. I think when people saw the judgment again, I won't spoil. We'll we'll build up to that. They were surprised because I've heard only horror stories from our the LTB. Yeah, and I, again, I don't want to like, I don't want to say that this is a good court because it's not. So let's just put that clear. It's just a lot of work that went went into it. So just to bring us back, um, last time I was here, I explained a little bit more on the rent strikes that we're running in in York Southwestern. These buildings in during Lawrence and Kiel, uh, 1440 and 1442 Lawrence, are just two like next to each other, same landlord. They're actually the closest you have to what we normally refer to as a slumlord. Like all landlords are bad, but some are particularly worse than others. Um, and this is one of those cases. Like just the issue that the the postal workers in said, we're not entering this building because it's unsafe for us because of the bed bag infestation. So postal workers were bringing bed bags back to their home for three years. Tenants in this building had no mail delivered to the building because the postal worker said this is not safe, and Canada Post agreed with the the workers' complaint. Um, so they had to drive like 20 minutes to a Canada Post facility just to pick up any kind of mail. So a lot of notices as well when got lost. Um, but imagine for the tenants being like, oh, the Canada Post is saying this is totally unhealth, even unhealthy to even step food on and we have to live here yeah like anyone presented with this fact it's just it's, as awful as it is it's so validating right like you tell a judge judge yeah this is how bad it is oh like what do they say to that because i want to unpack this as we go and i don't want to forget this unbalanced onus right that this expectation that tenants have to pay every month no matter what the same the, the amount that's been told to them they have no control on almost will show over these above grade increases we'll also talk about so you know which are essentially evictions to them and they can't get their landlord to repair shit in their place the post office won't deliver but you know they're a criminal if they don't pay their rent and it's up to them to go through all these hoops that you know bruno's talked about and and we'll talk about to get their side of the end met. You know, there's an agreement when you sign into a rent that yes, you'll pay your rent, but also you won't live amongst like bugs and holes in your ceiling for too long. And there's an expectation, you know, your rent won't increase to the point where you know that they're essentially kicking you and your family out. And there's like almost no mechanisms to uphold even that. And it's really even hard in the public narrative to reinforce that, like until they hear stories like this going, okay, that's bad. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't need to get this bad. So, but the argument we made in all of the rent strikes is, as you said, so, okay, let's go on the formal channel, which is we have a contract. I pay my rent. You give me a decent place to live. <laughs> You're not giving me a place, decent place to live. You're harassing me. So I'm going to stop paying my rent with my neighbors. Uh, we're going to do it together. So I think that's kind of the response. And it takes, obviously, it takes a lot of courage and a collective courage because of all the fears that come with the possibility of, of eviction. But I think that's what makes the rent strikes so beautiful because you can win or lose. And I want to say that we, you know, you, you may not win all the time. You might not win everything you wanted when you started it. Like, it's not like a zero sum game. There is a lot of that happens in the process and you, you know, but you definitely win so much in terms of popular confidence. Like people suddenly are like, Fuck this, you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna say stop to this. I'm gonna talk to and I'm gonna gain like that confidence that we have to face a landlord because in this case and in so many others, there's always a feeling that you know landlords have the upper hand, there's nothing we can do, etc. So that's breaking with that, it's huge. And I think in these buildings they've done that so many times. This last hearing is kind of like the last straw, but they did it when they started the rent strike in October. They did it when in December last year, one of the tenants was illegally evicted. I mean, all evictions are illegal in our minds. This one was just a nefarious process that included the Toronto police. We had a 72-hour standoff with an entire police division in the tenants occupying the landlord's office. Um, and then they gave the tenant back her unit. And so they won again. And, and now this is kind of like the third time because 
what was happening is that the landlord was taking everybody to court for withholding rent, saying, you owe me money, so I, I want to evict you. That's like how it happens. How The issue is every time a landlord takes you to court, you are allowed to bring your own grievances. Oopsies. And that's kind of part of what uh, the strategy is. So, okay, well, a tenant application by itself takes more than two years to be heard at the landlord and tenant board. Well, a landlord one takes between six and eight months. So so you actually expedite the process of airing your grievances in front of the LTB. Yeah, when you know, like, okay, so the landlord is so desperate to have a hearing about this. Let's go. We're going to bring our own things. <laughs> That's yeah. the confidence we all need, Bruno. <laughs> I'm ready. But you can do it when you have, I think, the numbers of people involved and that people are so, like, I think it takes that time of, it, it is not from one week to the other. It takes a long time to prepare people for it. But yeah, so uh, what happened is that um, as they started taking people to the LTV or to, we made the argument that because there's so many tenants on the same building, this is clearly a collective issue. It's not an individual. Everybody's having the same problems. So it should be all consolidated into one hearing, which is in itself quite a big, victory on on that and we have an amazing team of uh, of a legal team that is being supportive of all all movements in Toronto that has supported us as well is that the community justice collective yes that's them they're amazing shout out to them and yeah so once that happens basically what we did is then say actually we're going to also file against the landlord collectively so we take you to court too in a separate hearing or no, it's going to be all one. The thing is, it all gets joined. One big show. So, okay. yeah. So the idea is like, okay, <laughs> so you want to go? We're going to go with you and we're going to also bring... Did they fight this along the way? Like all of these moves to first make it a collective hearing and then uh, air your grievances at the same time? Did they push back on that? Yeah, they push back on everything. Of course. Whenever you go to this hearing, the first hearing is a key one, but the landlords always say, no, 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 this is it's one thing at a time, etc. cetera. Um, but it's clearly a collective grievance here. Um, so the issue is, what did we do? For two months, we spent canvassing all of the buildings a again. It's about 400 units and brought more than one, I think it's more than 120 units, all of the problems they were having individually right so you had a problem they had not fixed your bathtub this is a moment so we gather photos videos the whole thing and we presented a collective tenant it's called a, a t6 form that is tenants can collectively file it and say everybody who's signing here is having these problems and then you just list all of them you present as much evidence as you can you probably needed extra pages for that t6 form <laughs> yeah, the the whole thing was very long. And then to add to that with it, another one that is about tenant rights violations. So these are all the instances that we have recorded that the landlord actually directly interfere with tenant organizing. They try to take out posters. They try to take out banners. They send us security. Uh, they lied and harass tenants. We have like... Illegal evictions. You were able to include that in the discussion as well. Illegal evictions, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So all of that is basically <laughs> what came to a head in in this uh, in this hearing that uh, that you were saying from August first. This just a little step before is that there is a, something called a case management hearing when the landlord and tenant board calls the parties and says, "Okay, so the landlord wants to get their money back, and the tenants have all of these complaints." So that's when you agree to have a big hearing where everything is going to be discussed and resolved. Normally that takes a few months, but we said, no, look, we need an urgent solution. We need an urgent hearing on repairs and maintenance. Tenants are living under very poor conditions. And we need that hearing to happen within less than a month. We need it now because people cannot live like this. That's when really having done a lot of work with the media and to actually make public pressure on the landlord also helps because the landlord and tenant board were aware of everything that we had done. So I don't know if maybe if you follow or not, but we took the pest back to the landlord's head office in Bay Street. 
Um, so we brought cockroaches or bed bugs. We brought cockroaches, mice, and rats um, to their head office in, in on Bay Street on a weekday, um, and it was a beautiful scene. Uh, well, not really, but yeah. No, no, like beautiful <laughs> in terms of uh, I understand sentiment. Comic, comical in so many ways because. Here you're in like the heart of Bay Street where Barney River, who's the landlord, and I haven't mentioned them yet, Barney River's head offices are um, Adelaide and Young, around that, or Bay, Adelaide and Bay. And all these people in suits going about their day, and then suddenly <laughs> we show up with all of these dead mice and just like <laughs> swinging it <laughs> in front of the cameras. Oh no, it's like not in a cage or anything. No, no, it's... we took it out and like, and like like dangled it around and said this is what we have to live with and you know Barney River should and on top of that we ask our friends in the Ayatsi which is the stage workers uh, union we asked them to if we could borrow Scabby which is the massive rat that normally unions put outside of any strike so yeah we we borrowed Scabby from them and we had Scabby right at the front of the protest with a sign that said, I love Barney River. So we got a lot of attention and it helped to really make it so clear and obvious that there is a problem here with this landlord and the way they're treating their tenants. Um, so the LTV agreed and said, let's have a hearing. <laughs> Do you think that was like, yes, because we you can't live in these conditions or Barney River was like, we need to shut these people up. Like... <laughs> Barney River did not agree to the, the the hearing. They they were like, no, no, this should not happen. Um, you know, there are maintenance issues that we're dealing with. That's, that's all they would say. <laughs> I'll say. Um, so they didn't want to have this hearing. And also, um, we had so much evidence from tenants that it was very difficult for them to... They should have just gone and said, look, we apologize, but... They also doubled down in some of the things they responded that they were just even more scandalous. So, for example, one of the, there's a, the director of operations of Barney River is one of the is a witness that they brought in. So we're our our legal team is questioning him and he says, well, the problem with cockroaches and pests is that people leave food outside and that's what cockroaches feed on. So blame it on tenants. And then our lawyers ask, okay, so, well, what's the food source of bed bugs? And he says, people. Because <laughs> bed bugs don't eat, like, crumbs. Bed bugs is the leave of people. So it just, like, with, you know, a shapeless attitude. Um, but anyways, they, I think they, they lost badly. They got order. This is quite... I don't know if I'm presidenting. It must have happened very few times in history that in of the LTV that they order six weeks to get over a hundred units repaired. I was going to ask what the timeline was because you just said 120 units uh, had evidence of something and six weeks. I mean, okay, so that was three weeks ago. Is there movement? Yeah, that's what is kind of uh, exciting that people are getting their shed fixed. You shouldn't take that this much to get your shed fixed. I know, like, I it's know. It's also like, such a simple thing. Victories are victories. We yeah, will take course, them, but we'll take oh them. my God. Um, but yeah, people are getting their shed fixed. There's many changes that have happened. So people are getting things fixed. New things that come up, they're responding right away. The, um, they're starting to like clean common spaces, things that they hadn't done. And one important thing is that the attitude of the company changed a lot. So until we had this hearing, any tenant that would go to the office and say, look, um, you know, there are bed packs in my unit, the management will say, well, you're part of the tenant union, so um, we're not going to fix it. We're not going to do any for, anything for you until you go back to paying. Were they that bold? <laughs> Super, to, very, and to... very aggressive, like very, very aggressive, um, like threatening with, we're going to evict you. Uh, don't even come to the office. Also, this all happened. We did take over their office, so the office is kind of like a fortress now. They only allow one people at a time. It's like that's your fault, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is this the same instance? Like, I know you guys were occupying the office, but 
Do I remember hinges coming off of a tenant's door to regain entry? Yeah, that was, but that was not the the door of the office. It was of their unit. The t- yeah, like to undo an illegal eviction, essentially. Yes, yeah, yeah. I love that story because it tells speaks to the collective knowledge that exists. You don't even know exists, like the little talents and skill sets that you accumulate when you just have a community of people. And it might be someone who can remove hinges off doors, so you can get in <laughs> when you need to. I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, what happened is, is this: the tenant gets locked, gets locked out. We occupy the office, and all of us are like, "We're not moving here until you let the tenant back in and reinstate their tenancy, etc." Like at the second day, they have to give you seventy-two hours to enter your unit to take out your stuff when you get evicted. Right, and there was medication, even right. The, yeah. Oh, the the role of the police, like we can go on that. The the cops trying to actually encourage the tenant to go to the hospital because of she was not getting access to the medication. She was not feeling well at all. The cops were like really trying to encourage her to go to the hospital so that they, they could clear the occupation. Uh, and it was really the, the paramedics that said she doesn't need a hospital. It's up to her, but she doesn't need one right now. But, but anyways, what happens is that for whatever reason, the superintendent accepts to go says okay you can and re-enter the unit to get your stuff the immediate stuff we need you need so the tenant and a couple of us enter the unit not to leave <laughs> to reinstate the he realizes it and he takes off the door he's like no 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 i'm i'm gonna call the cops you know and he is a superintendent that takes off the door when he's leaving with the door i stop him and i take the door and i'm like no no the door stays uh, he didn't want to fight. He, this Why is like, wasn't this on the live stream? I think yeah. I missed this one. <laughs> no, no, because this part was, it was a little heated. And anyways, I take back the door and he's also like a, you know, this guy's on a very low income. It's not, he's not going to go, go in a, in a fight. So he just lets it go. But I stay with the door and I don't, I, I am the person that doesn't know what to do with the door uh, or what the hinges are for. So... <laughs> and that's when, yeah. The door stays stays there um, until someone came and said, yeah, I just, you know, I can get extra hinges at Home Depot and we'll put it back. And they, we put back the door and we kind of informally reinstated the tenancy until the landlord actually agreed to it and gave her back the keys and everything. That is badass, Bruno. The door stays. <laughs> I'll draw the line. You are not taking this door. I mean. I think what was funny to me is that I, I, I got very like, no, no, the door is staying, but then I didn't know what to do with a door that you're just holding. Well, thank God someone knew what to do with the <laughs> somebody, door. Exactly. Somebody could jump on that. Yeah. It was a matter of principle at that point, right? We were. Exactly. The victory wasn't secured until the door was. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, you were just a door in a, actually a very risky just having a door without it being able to use it as a door is not very helpful. Um, yeah, so that had happened and, and th- there was all, all of that tension with the property management office. Um, this this change after this hearing is a big change because they've actually even, they fired two of the worst staff that they had, the most aggressive ones, they got rid of them and now they have you know a more welcoming we can say policy that people don't go to the office and get yelled at and kicked out right away so it's a big change in terms of how tenants live imagine just living in constant tension with oh i yeah i know exactly what that is like I, and it's awful but like, people don't realize like you know they usually also live on the ground floor to the people you're dealing with or the office you have to deal with and you're completely at the whim of your landlord i guess until you make these connections and start to kind of act as a collective rather than just asking and begging for some repairs with the backlog must be incredible at the LTB. Yeah. I know the folks at on Lawrence there have the repairs coming. Are they also facing above grade rent increases? Above grade and rent increases. Yes. So that's one of the reasons as well why they went on rent strike. Imagine... You're living in these conditions, and on top of that, the landlord says, I've actually done this incredible capital repairs that I deserve more money from you. You will lose your shit, and rightly so. Um, <laughs> I'm losing my shit. Like, yeah. 
on top of that, what happened with that is that the LTV has a hearing. This is back like two years ago. Tenants don't get noticed that there is a hearing because there is no mail. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they go ahead with the hearing. The LTV gives the landlord the authorization, but then we end up appealing it, fighting it, and now the hearing has to be redone, basically. Too bad you couldn't have tied that in with the <laughs> hearing in which you got to present all the evidence of you, this wonderful improvements that they've made that you're benefiting from. <laughs> that I just want to side note on that for a second. Sorry, Bruno, but this is maddening and we, we just kind of assumed everyone knew what we were talking about. That's my fault. So above grade or above guideline increases are, you know, exceptions that are made to any kind of weak ass rent controls that we have. Okay. And it can even include increased municipal fees and taxes as a reason to raise the rents above what meager protections there were. And so they, they do often just equal eviction because who out there has another $500 a month? to add to their rent. So it's like these people get really pushed up against the wall, but the idea that they can pass this cost of business, this capital upgrade, as like Bruno calls it, because that's what it does. It increases their capital in the end, right? Their property is worth more. They are still going to be able to increase rent. Like it doesn't have to be at obscene amounts, right? They could still say, I've done these improvements. I can qualify for some sort of increase, but like they just squeezing blood out of a stone, right? Families and folks trying to make ends meet. And in the end, they win again, right? Not only do they get more rent from you, but you just paid for all of those upgrades that you won't really benefit from. I mean, you might have a new balcony, but you know, you have a hole in your ceiling or you live with bed bugs or you don't get mail. And even if the upgrades were perfect, like you, you had a great property management, maybe they exist <laughs> somewhere, uh, but you still don't get those benefits. That absolutely is the cost of doing business. If they want to increase their capital, that should be them that pays for those repairs. It's it's absurd. It's absurd on so many levels. It is really, I think uh, our friend Ricardo Tranjana at the CCPA, he wrote the tenant class. He did recently a, a report about AGIs. It's very helpful to understand, I think, because it's not just about squeezing more money out of tenants. It's also about getting them tired and displacing them, as you said. Yeah. Like it is that that process because part of the AGIs is just trying to apply as many times as possible and getting people just tired of fighting them. Because you can fight as a as a tenant, as a collective of tenants, you can fight AGIs, you can go to the hearings and say they didn't fix this, this is bullshit, etc. But that process, you know, gets very, very tiring and you know already the chances of winning at the LTV are very small or maybe none. So it's it's also kind of forcing displacement. Um, it is one of the key elements that they're using. And they didn't used to exist until the late 1990s. Like AGIs are a relatively new thing. Landlords make it sound as if without that, all buildings will be crumbling. Um, and at the same time, every time you, because we follow this, every time you hear their investor reports, they are doing very well. <laughs> like... Yeah, they, they don't share their profits with you, no, right? Exactly. But Do they? No, no, no. no you of you guys not. don't get any kind of dividends. <laughs> like when you've done so well as, as tenants that you've helped pay for that property that they have and you've paid for their shareholder dividends and that's not enough. You also have to pay for like these upgrades that some people don't even ask for. Like some of them are so ridiculous and superficial. Like we talked about greenwashing a little bit on the last episode Bruno, now, are there landlords that will, you kind of implied this, I just want to clarify, repeatedly apply for these above grade? Like, even if they're successful, there's no limit to this madness? There is a limit. Okay. They're supposed to have a year in between. <laughs> yeah. No, and they do. Like, the thing is, one, one thing with above guideline rent increases is that this is mostly big landlords. It is very costly for a small landlord to do the application. Okay. Small landlords have other problems. I don't want to, I, I hate the mom and pop landlords are good and the problem is a big landlord. No. We had Ricardo on, he smashed that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it's, it's like own use evictions are exploding in, in Ontario and that's all small landlords. There's no CEO that could claim he's moving into a, a unit himself and his family. But so AGIs are really like this 
quite an industrial complex now developed around AGIs. It's a couple of legal firms that take on them. It's a little bit of a complex application. You need to calculate, for example, how much, how many years the repairs you did are going to last how you divide it along across all of the tenants that are affected. So it's it's not easy to apply for them, but by now they they you know they have this machinery. Perfected it. Yeah. And it's funny because yeah. we see it's the same legal firms. We see them all the time in each of the battles. And it's like, come on, like we're going at it. They wouldn't have good relationships with these adjudicators, would they? <laughs> Often they come from the same firms. Yeah. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they can apply, they have to take like a year in between, but what happens often is that they apply for an AGI, which are these are above guideline rent increases. You can apply for up to 9% extra rent divided over three years. So maximum of 3% per year of extra rent from whatever the provincial government decides is the guideline. So 33 King, which is the building that started the rent strikes, they have the highest number of above island rent increases. They fight one that was in 2018 that they got, a, you know, they got managed to cut in half. Then the rents have to update, but the landlord applied for 2019, for 2021. It just, the whole process is very infuriating. And that's why there are many campaigns to just scrap them, you know, get rid of this. While you bring them up, how is the rent strike at 33 King Street and 22 John? That they were kind of both dealing with Dream Unlimited. And like just to remind folks who have missed my repeated jabs at municipal politicians, these folks like wine and dine with our leaders. Um, yep. It's a very same circles. And we know, again, developers pay quite dearly for campaigns um, of all political stripes. I mean, I'm not sure there's a campaign they don't fund. I mean, I'm sure there's a few, but we know. <laughs> we know who those are but yeah it's um very troubling to think that we, all of these people kind of are operating together in this way right because they're the ones that could set these rules. yeah so dream dream is a good example of like the landlord developer influence and extortion that they actually play on all levels of government and on society today i mean there are many way many reasons why different levels of government support these guys but the core of it is that they managed now to convince that only supply will resolve our issues. That, you know, if they build more, then everything is going to be better. <laughs> That's, and that is so ingrained in yeah. every, it's not just politicians. It's like the bureaucracy of the state. It's, it's like all over, the, it's on the policy side of all these experts, the Twitter experts, the Mike Moffats of the world, all of these people are, that's, that, that's it, that's ingrained. So what do developers like Dream say? It's like, well, we're not going to build. If you don't give me all these concessions, we're not going to build. And there is no government that wants to be seen as not, as confronting a developer. They love announcing affordable housing units, right? They love affordable housing units, photo ops, and Dream can provide that. Yeah, yeah. And they are, and they're experts really at, at that kind of like, we're building affordable housing green with, you know, all these perks and... Even their name, Dream. The, Dream Unlimited, exactly. And they, yeah, they're they're kind of the example. So of, of all of that, just to add that, they bankrolled Anna Bailao's campaign for mayor. It's also not that they just innocently, they run their own people for, for mayor. I was going to say, doesn't she work for them? I was trying to... I mean, the argument is whether she no. ever stopped working no. for them. The but no. she's definitely formally now, she's their affordable housing. Um... At least now she's getting paid on the books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they gave her the office. All of them donated the max to her campaign. So, uh, you know, there's all of that. So sweet. Um, so those... Those rent strikes are yes yeah, still ongoing. Where we're at now is that there is, and this is similar to the Lawrence buildings, there is a strong blockade from landlords. They don't want to negotiate with tenants. They don't want to give any kind of concession that could be seen as a collective win of tenants and that could spark others saying, well, if these guys did it, why not us? Because that would be legitimizing 
the rent strike in a way, right? Because they like to paint this and their lawyers like to paint this as something criminal. They would argue there is no legal basis for a rent strike. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So basically on those two, and it's similar with the Barney River ones, it's just that in this case, we managed to speed up the process with our own presentations. But on 33 King and 22 John, we have hearings at the LTV coming up. We are going to be sharing it all over because we want to show for real what a landlord like Dream is really about. And if anything, these hearings will be used for that. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you for coming on and sharing this. We're not going to stop talking about it. So perhaps some of the tenants that you worked with, uh, we'll call them back. But I will link folks to you and the York Southwestern Tenant Union and a couple of the stories we talked about. And I'll even throw in the episode with Ricardo Tranjan because that explains a lot, especially when we start talking about it being the pivotal kind of issue of the working class and starting to reimagine ourselves as, you know, the tenant class. Um, that was a great one. It all, it all ties together. I always appreciate the time you take for us, Bruno. Thank you very much. And congratulations. You should share that with everyone. Cause it's like, yeah, Santiago and I, we got on the phone right away. We're like, did you see? It was like, yes, call Bruno right away. <laughs> we wanted to share it. We don't get to share a lot of victories. So when they happen, it is important. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content, and if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.